everyone, it's Jack from Cultaholic.com filling in for Mr. Bacchini this week, and it's time to look at SmackDown Live. Now, obviously, yesterday we took a look at the Raw reunion. We graded that. Uh, some of you agreed with my opinion. Some of you disagreed, and that's fine, guys. That's okay. We've all got opinions. You know, yours, yours are wrong, but it's okay. It's fine. Uh, let's see if SmackDown was any better than Raw was. There's only one way to find out, and that is by assigning each individual segment a lovely individual grade. Let's get right to it. So first of all, Shane McMahon came out to open the show, the best in the world, but we had some commentary changes to talk about as well. Uh, unfortunately, Byron Saxton was away because his father sadly passed away. Uh, he was replaced by, well, it was a team of Tom Phillips, David Otunga, and the New Day, Xavier Woods and Big E. Corey Graves wasn't on the show either, and then midway through the show, Woods and Big E would be replaced by Michael Cole. So it was a bit of a loose feel, but it actually worked pretty all right. Apparently Shawn Michaels was actually supposed to be on commentary for this episode, but he wasn't. Uh, and they mentioned that quite a few times. They were like, well, Shawn was meant to be here, but I guess we got the New Day instead. But to be honest, once we see the way they use Shawn Michaels midway through the episode, I actually think that was probably for the best. Shane put over the Raw reunion as a great show and said it was great to see so many old faces and new ones as well, but one face that he was delighted not to have seen at the Raw reunion was Kevin Owens. And then Shane referred to himself as the best of the world, the best of the world, Shane. Shane refreshed our minds if we hadn't seen Kevin Owens' social media challenge for him. Basically, KO challenged Shane to a match at SummerSlam with the condition that if Owens loses, he will quit WWE. And Shane accepted this proposal. So we're going to see Shane McMahon versus Kevin Owens at SummerSlam. The first of quite a few new SummerSlam matchups set up on this episode of SmackDown. Shane then rolled footage of, I think it was last year, when Kevin Owens sat in the ring and basically just went, I quit and walked out. Um, which I kind of disagreed with because I feel like it implied that Owens is a quitter and that Shane is correct. He's the one in the right in this feud. Um, obviously, that's not the message they're trying to get across, but I feel like it may have been a little bit lost in translation. But it's all right because Owens comes out and references the video and says, you know what? I'll hold my hands up. That was a very dark time in my career, but I'm different now. And I'm really glad, Shane, that you accepted the challenge for SummerSlam. I knew you would because one, you want to see me gone from WWE, and two, you just love the limelight, don't you? Owens heads to the ring to try and kick Shane's ass, but instead Shane says, stop right there. I'm booking you in a match later on tonight against Roman Reigns. I'm going to give this a B. It wasn't the cleanest promo segment in the world. There was a little bit of stumbling over words here and there, but it got the job done. Uh, I also thought that it was a good example of bad versus good continuity in WWE. For example, bad continuity would be rolling the footage of Owens quitting last year because it didn't really play into the storyline. It was taking a moment, isolating it from its context and using it to make the heel look like the correct one in the feud. I, I wasn't sure I agreed with that. But then we had good continuity on commentary when Xavier Woods, well, when Owens came out, Woods went, I don't like this guy, but I want to see him kick Shane's ass. Just because they're both baby faces, Woods and Kevin Owens at the minute, doesn't mean they have to like each other. And Woods is obviously remembering that it wasn't that long ago since KO turned on the New Day. So I love that. This segment gets a B and I thought it was a decent opening to the show. Next up, we had a non-title match between the reigning Intercontinental Champion Shinsuke Nakamura and Apollo Crews. And this pretty much was exactly what it should have been. A, a sort of middle-length match, one which was a decent showcase for Apollo and showed him to be a fighting, you know, good athlete in the ring and pretty brave and resilient. But ultimately, it was Shinsuke who picked up the victory. Nakamura then reinforced his sort of ruthless heel status, beating down Apollo Crews afterwards and hitting the Kinshasa on the outside. Uh, this gets to be, as I say, it was everything it needed to be. There's no way that Shinsuke should have been losing this match so soon after becoming IC champion, but also it was a decent account of Apollo Crews as well. Next up, Miz TV, which began with a very long Raw reunion video package, but it's all right. You know, I, once again, I have to marvel at how good WWE's editing team are or video package team, uh, just because they, they really do make every single show look like the best wrestling you've ever seen. It was really, honestly, quite impressive in such a short turnaround as well. Miz introduces his guest for the night, the heartbreak kid, Shawn Michaels. And if you haven't seen this, I urge you to watch Shawn Michaels' entrance because the New Day freak out on commentary. They're singing along, dancing along. Big E did a bit of a Kyle O'Reilly playing the guitar. 
on his SmackDown Tag Team Championship title belt. Uh, Kyle O'Reilly then tweeted him after the show and said, you've played that championship loot marvelously. Yeah, it's not a guitar, it turns out it's a loot. And uh, he then asked if he wants to fight for it. I'd love to see the New Day versus the Undisputed Era, but I don't really think it's gonna happen, which is sad. But anyway, Miz asks Sean what he thought of the Raw reunion. He actually addressed some of the criticism, which was mainly verbalized through the heels on Raw. He said, you know, some guys thought that they were being pushed aside by these old timers. What's your view, Sean? And in fairness, my Michaels gave a very good and balanced answer. He said, I've been on both sides of the fence. I was once a younger guy in the locker room looking at these legends saying, why am I not getting a shot? And then he said, you know what? As Austin mentioned at the end of Raw, it's all a big family. And whenever we're all asked to come together, it's really hard to say no. And I totally understand that. And I respect it as well. I respect you, heartbreak kid. Shawn Michaels, I respect your opinions. HBK then talks about how they inducted an honorary new member into the DX slash The Click last night, Seth Rollins, a bit of the show that I absolutely hated. But luckily they don't dwell on it too long because Dolph Ziggler's music hits and you can kind of hear everyone in the arena and presumably watching at home as well kind of go, oh no, but don't worry because this actually turned out pretty good. Ziggler says he used to idolize Shawn Michaels, but now it's just embarrassing because he shuffles out to the ring every opportunity he gets, and it's really time for him to move on, which is very pertinent, I guess, and very relevant, considering that it's one day after the Raw reunion show. He even says that it's as embarrassing as Goldberg in a wrestling ring, which is, I'm starting, is anyone else starting to feel a little bit sorry for Goldberg? Like, yes, his match was terrible with The Undertaker, but at the same time, you know, he didn't deliberately try and have a bad match. I feel quite bad that he's just getting just dunked on by everybody in WWE, especially Matt Riddle, but Ziggler got a little shot in as well. He also said that Shawn's return in that tag match against Kane and Undertaker was embarrassing, and Shawn Michaels goes, you know what? Yes, it was embarrassing, but not as embarrassing as devoting your entire career to being a second-rate Shawn Michaels. Ziggler then retorts with maybe the line of the night, saying there's only one second-rate Shawn Michaels in the ring right now, mate and I'm looking at him right now. He called Shawn Michaels a second-rate Shawn Michaels. Ziggler then goes to hit Shawn, but Shawn ducks, so he hits the Miz instead, so then Shawn hits Ziggler, and then Shawn's checking on Miz, and then when he turns around, bang, super kick straight to Shawn Michaels' face from Dolph Ziggler, and suddenly, I'm so invested in Ziggler again. I, I know that, you know, their track record with booking Ziggler has been pretty bad over the past quite a long time, but this has given me a little bit of hope. I found this genuinely quite compelling. This gets a B plus. I really did enjoy this segment, and I think that it's the sort of feud, I know the feud's between Ziggler and Miz, not Ziggler and Michaels, but it's the sort of feud I can get behind for Ziggler just because it's better than randomly inserting him into the title picture for no reason. It's something that's relevant to Ziggler's character and the history of his character as well, and I do actually really appreciate that. Next up, the weakest part of the night for me, unfortunately, Charlotte Flair versus Ember Moon, a match that if it was given time could be absolutely excellent, but it was given no time at all. Within seconds, Bailey showed up, distracted Charlotte, and Ember rolled her up for the pinfall victory. And I was just like, no, like, I really wanted to see that match, especially in a week where WWE have been again criticized for giving the women's division a really reduced spotlight. I thought the segment was gonna get even worse when Ember rolled out of the ring and stood next to Bailey and they were all friends and stuff like, oh, we got one over on you, Charlotte. Because, you know, I was like, what are you doing? You're wrestling each other for the title at SummerSlam. But then Ember did prove me wrong. She rolled Bailey in the ring. Uh, Bailey was attacked by Charlotte, but then Ember used the distraction to hit the eclipse on Charlotte and then another eclipse on Bailey. And she stood tall at the end of the segment. Unfortunately, I have to give this segment quite a low grade. I'm going to give it a D plus. The only saving grace for me is that Ember came out on top at the end, but there were so many things wrong with this. First of all, it didn't build up Ember at all as a, as a number one contender because she looked very fortunate and opportunistic in winning the match rather than actually strong and good at wrestling. She just looked lucky because Bailey distracted Charlotte and all she had to do was roll up Charlotte for the three. Secondly, could they not have just had Ember and Charlotte go like 15 minutes? I'd have loved to have seen that match. And I think that, you know what, there's nothing really wrong with giving Ember the win over Charlotte. It would have made her look like a strong, viable contender for the SmackDown Women's Championship. And we don't need to protect Charlotte as much as she constantly is, I really don't think. And then also, the third thing wrong with this is that Charlotte is being shoehorned into yet another title feud. Uh, and it's only going to be a matter of time before the fans start to really, really reject this, especially after WrestleMania, which many people still think should have just been Becky versus Ronda, and Charlotte didn't really need to be there. And by association, that really harmed Asuka, if you remember, because Asuka won the SmackDown Women's title from Becky, then Charlotte won it from Asuka just to get her into that WrestleMania match. Instead, why don't we have Charlotte have a feud with someone not with a title? You know, have someone have a feud about something, anything else, just write something and create a feud. Feuds don't have to be about gold. 
They can be about anything you want, really. And as long as it's got a solid reason behind it, I think the fans would enjoy it. So why not have Charlotte have a feud with just anyone else over anything? And then presumably she'd win that. And then she can go on to face the winner of Bailey versus Ember. That's just what I would do. But I, I do think it's better than what what's going on right now with Charlotte. Next up, we have Kofi Kingston's SummerSlam declaration where he comes to the ring and basically calls out his opponent or his choice of opponent for the title match at SummerSlam. Kofi chooses Randy Orton and hopes that he accepts and then Orton comes out and the two have a bit of a promo battle and it's pretty good stuff as well. Almost all of the promo segments on this show were fairly strong. It was like the SmackDown of a few months ago before the wildcard rule kind of messed everything up. And I, I did think that the writing on this show was actually pretty solid for the most part. They do a really good job of incorporating real life stuff into this without compromising the kayfabe aspect of it. So Kofi brings up their battle years ago at MSG when he put Randy Orton through the table. Uh, and then Orton says, I didn't hold you back. Kofi said, you used your influence to hold me back. Orton says, I didn't. I just did you a favor because you weren't ready then and you're not ready now. Orton also says, he had a lot of good lines in this. He said that he's been on top for years and he didn't need to do anything to get there apart from just be himself. He didn't need to throw pancakes or do fake accents. He also says that Kofi doesn't deserve the title and the only reason he's got it is because Orton injured Ali back before Elimination Chamber and that led to Kofi getting an opportunity. And really, he says that Kofi's lucky and he's going to prove that at SummerSlam. Oh, this, this is pretty good, you know? This gets a B+. I am pretty hyped for this match. Uh, I often think that Randy Orton gets too much flack for being boring or whatever when often it's just the fault of uninspired writing or booking uh, which has kind of plagued him for a lot of his career but when he's on form I think Orton's wonderful and he's got you know timing and in-ring stuff like nobody else so I'm, I'm looking forward to this match and I hope it delivers. Next up we have Kofi Kingston versus Samoa Joe, a non-title match of course, but I, I found it hard to get excited for this match to be honest. I think it's because we just saw the pair wrestle for the title at Extreme Rules. So the match itself was a little bit hard for me to get into, but it was really saved actually by the post-match stuff. So basically, as Kofi is starting to heat up, Orton slides into the ring and tries to hit him with the RKO, but Kofi's ready, which I think is a really good call. It shows that Kofi is a smart champion and he's really prepared for his challenger. Uh, they, ring, they ring the bell, you know, Kofi wins by DQ, which annoys Samoa Joe, obviously, because he's lost the match. He goes to turn Randy Orton around and is just met with an instant RKO, but then Orton gets up and is met with an instant trouble in paradise. It's like a one-two. I really did enjoy the fast-paced nature of the post-match segment. This gets a B grade. You know, the, the match itself I found hard to get into, but the post-match stuff was excellent, which I think averages out into a lovely little B grade. And it also really makes me want to see the story of their match at SummerSlam, Kofi versus Orton, to be Kofi just reversing each and every RKO attempt, really showing that he's done his homework on his challenger. Next up, Finn Balor's out and is interviewed in the ring by Kayla, who asks him what he thinks about Bray Wyatt, because obviously Balor was the first person to be attacked by Wyatt upon his return as the Fiend. Uh, Balor says he doesn't really know how Bray's mind works, and he can't explain any of this, the whole Fiend thing, the puppets, the attack on Mick Foley at the Raw reunion, and Balor does a, a pretty decent job of seeming a little bit shaken by this. But he's also said that he's stared fear in the eyes before and he's never backed down in the past and he's not going to start backing down now. This is the cue for Wyatt to appear on the screen, but not as the Fiend. It was a stroke of genius, this. He actually appears as the Firefly Funhouse presenter once again. And the crowd audibly popped for that, which was really cool to hear. Wyatt is one of the best promos around, man. He, he cuts such a good promo being really nice to Finn, saying, oh, Finn, we all really like you, me and Mercy the Buzzard and Ramblin' Rabbit, we're all big fans of yours, but the Fiend's not a big fan of yours, and he accepts your challenge for SummerSlam. So that's another big SummerSlam match set up, Wyatt versus Bala, a match which, honestly, Wyatt should really, really dominate, I think. I'm going to give this an A-, minus. I think it was my favourite thing on the show, and I'm so glad that they're going with this whole disturbing split personality thing with Bray, rather than just having him be the Fiend now. It was great to see the Firefly Funhouse return, and Bray does an excellent job, whether whether he's being the fiend or whether he's being this unnervingly nice presenter of the Firefly Funhouse. Loved it. And finally, the main event, Kevin Owens versus Roman Reigns, as set up by Shane McMahon earlier on in the night. Also earlier on in the night, we saw Shane basically make this match a bit of a mockery. He installed himself as the special guest ring announcer, Drew as the special guest referee, and Elias as the special guest timekeeper. So we can kind of see where this is going to go. So Shane's predictably a dick during the ring announcements. He buries them. He says that Roman Reigns, the big dog from Pensacola, Florida, the man I beat, uh, where was it? The man he beat in Saudi Arabia, was it? I can't remember. So, yeah, Super Showdown. He says that he points out that he's beaten Roman Reigns. Then he goes, oh, Kevin Owens, the man I'm going to beat at SummerSlam. Owens has had enough of this. He gets out the ring, grabs a mic and says, right, I'm going to run through everybody here to get to Shane McMahon because I just want to get my hands on him tonight. Roman then gets the mic and says, oh, you're going to run through me? 
Well, I guess I'm going to have to kick everybody's ass, and everyone in the crowd cheers, because just Roman's... Oh, he's so hot. He's so badass and hot. The match starts, and it's not really a match, it's just a, an angle, because Drew is just a dick all the way through as the referee. He's constantly breaking them up and saying, I'm the special guest referee, you listen to me. And then eventually Roman gets sick of this. Dex Drew throws him out the ring, and a kick starts a big brawl. The heels get the upper hand because they have the numbers advantage, and they're all beating down Roman Reigns. But actually, the baby faces recover, Kevin Owens makes the save, and he and Roman clear the ring, and then Shane tries to escape, gets thrown back in the ring by Roman, and Kevin Owens hits him with the Stone Cold Stunner. The KO Stunner hits him with a Stunner. I'm gonna give this a C plus. I wasn't particularly invested in the whole setup with all the heels in positions of authority. I knew kind of how it was gonna go, and the, the ending did feel a little bit house showy with just the faces standing tall. I didn't mind it especially, I just think it could have been a different segment. It felt a little bit needless. Um, also, is it really wise to have Owen stun Shane every week, or are we gonna get diminishing returns on that? I'd quite like to see Owens now not get his hands on Shane until the match at SummerSlam. Overall, I'm going to give SmackDown a B plus. I thought it was a strong week for SmackDown, especially coming off the back of a Raw that I didn't really enjoy. Uh, and I, yeah, I enjoyed the writing on this show especially. The promo stuff was largely good across the board. In terms of negatives, the one big negative is, of course, the women's division right now. We only had one women's match, and it was very, very short, and it didn't really help anyone involved, I think. Not Bailey, not Ember, and not Charlotte Flair. In terms of positives, though, there was a lot to enjoy. I really enjoyed the Kofi Orton stuff, really enjoyed the Bray Finn stuff. Ziggler is now relevant, and, and you know, I, I enjoy that again. He's a good heel again, uh, which really stands, I guess, in testament to the inclusion of Michaels. Uh, also... I did enjoy, to a degree, the Kevin Owens and Shane stuff, and I am actually looking forward to that match at SummerSlam. So a strong SmackDown, good stuff, B+, is the overall grade. Thanks very much for watching, and let us know what you think in the comments section down below. You can follow Cultaholic on Twitter, at Cultaholic, and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Cultaholic. If you enjoy what we do, then please do check out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Cultaholic, where you can pledge. And don't forget, of course, most importantly of all, to hit subscribe and to join us.